This evening, Dr. Paul Rakes will present Don't Test Me, Saloons, Liquor, and Gunplay in West Virginia's Early Coal Camps. Economic opportunity attracted a number of people to the southern West Virginia coal fields in the late 19th, 19th and early 20th centuries. The early coal camps in Fayette and McDowell County and along the Cabin Creek District of Knob County witnessed a dramatic increase in population on what was, in essence, an industrial frontier. The attraction of liquor, saloons, and guns on the frontier led to frequent violence among a predominantly transient male population. The rise in violence in the coal fields caused political problems for West Virginia Governor Albert B. White and also found the state Supreme Court of Appeals wrestling with interpreting the cases within the change of legal philosophy from no duty to retreat to back against the wall. In fact, before the coal camps matured, these areas of West Virginia bore a striking similarity to the more famous fields of the late 19th century American West. Paul Rakes, Associate Professor of American History at WBU Tech, is a third generation coal miner of 20 years who then earned his PhD in history at West Virginia University. His research focuses on mining in West Virginia and he has produced such essays as Technology and Transition, The Dilemmas of Early 20th Century Coal Mining, for the Journal of Appalachian Studies, West Virginia Coal Mine Fatalities, The Subculture of Danger, and a Statistical Overview of the pre enforcement Era for West Virginia History, and a Combat Scenario, Early Coal Mining and the Culture of Danger in Culture, Class, and Politics in Modern Appalachia. Most recently, he co-authored a chapter in Blood in the Hills, a history of violence in Appalachia that focused on the American common law and legal concepts that influenced violence among the coal miners in the early southern West Virginia coal fields. Please welcome Dr. Riggs. Well, my first comment is, whoa! <laughs> I anticipated there would be nine or ten people in the audience. So whatever the hype has been, I doubt that I can live up to whatever that might, might have been. I'll do my best, but we don't expect too much. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, the archives for inviting me here tonight. Uh, and I certainly want to thank the archival staff, uh, especially patient, Deborah Basham, who has been extremely helpful during research for this particular topic. And Certainly Kathy Miller, for those of you who may know her. It was Kathy who pointed me in the right direction when I was stumped many times during the research. Also, I've been on vacation for the first time in about 10 years, and it's hard to get restarted, particularly at my age. And according to Kroger's, I am a senior citizen on Tuesday night, so uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little out of practice. Bear with me if I get a bit confused, which goes with being a senior citizen, right? Uh, also, the body's a little slower picking up these days. My dad used to caution me in the mines all the time. He'd say, when I do something that was rather silly to kind of abuse my body, he would say, you remember now, you want to be a good old man. <laughs> and I should have taken his advice, but for that matter, he should have taken his own advice. He was much more broke down than I am. But uh, sort of fits that old axiom, the older I get, the smarter my father was. Uh, but tonight's topic, uh, this is a topic that had never received significant attention, if any attention, really, by professional historians. Instead, our perception of coal miners and the violence that occurred during those early days of coal towns, uh, it's centered on studies of labor strikes. Uh, probably because more records existed for those episodes. They were somewhat famous in, in the thinking of the people in the area and throughout the nation for that matter. Well, there were several factors that had piqued my interest in this particular topic of coal miners and violence on an everyday, an everyday level. Um, one was comments that I heard during my time as a grad student when I was doing research, and archivists and other PhD students would, would just say in passing, did you notice in the newspaper uh, there are all these shootings and, and things going on. It must have been a rather violent era. 
but I was working on coal mine safety and explosions and that sort of thing, you know, something I couldn't pause to actually look at at the time. Secondly, one of the things that I noticed, particularly during the Pittston strike, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, 1989-1990, rather lengthy strike, and, and occasionally highly confrontational strike, but one of the things I noticed was that miners who already had a propensity to be rough, let's say, were the first to try to push any particular incident into a much more confrontational action or reaction. Now, I won't say where I fell in on, uh, among those folks, uh, although I'm sure the West Virginia State Troopers who all went to jail would certainly be willing to say that I was on the rougher side. I don't know. Uh, what I do remember is their bloody sandwiches that were terrible. But <coughs> even Cecil Roberts, president, now president of the didn't want to eat them. But this made me wonder somewhat about the historical models of uh, miners during the labor strikes in the early 20th century. Were there elements of that of those, stri of those striking bodies that were already leaning toward violence if the opportunity presented itself? But probably the most influential factor in my wanting to look into this topic originally came from the realities of my own family. As was mentioned, I'm a third generation coal miner, uh, but both my paternal and maternal uh, family were coal families who came from farms. They followed the typical Appalachian approach. They came from the farms in Virginia to the opportunity of wages, first in McDowell County and then into Fayette. And these, this family, both sides, my uncles, my great uncles, they were all miners. They were pleasant men in many ways, uh, rather polite, but they also were rough individuals. They had a rough edge. They were men with a sense of honor. And it's a sense of honor that most academics could never fully understand. You have to have been a part of it to fully understand it. Years ago, when Bertrand White Brown wrote a volume about Southern honor, it's difficult for an academic to define it. You have to be a part of it to really understand it because it's not, it's not finite. It's, it's a code of conduct that somewhat is involved in a, in a vortex that spins around, depends on a lot of situations. But <clears throat> among these rather rough individuals was particularly my paternal grandfather, born in, the, born in 1881, a rough and tumble individual, to say the least. To give you an example of how rough this individual was, he liked to drink, like many miners at the time. He got drunk. They, several folks tired of dealing with him. They waited until he went to sleep in the house. He's drunk. He's passed out. They burned the house down and killed him. And there was a court case, but there wasn't enough evidence. I'm not saying whether really or not he deserved it. But, but he was also my, mater my maternal grandfather, born in 1882, which, again, represents that I am indeed a senior citizen. Uh, what a ruffian this guy was. He killed four men before he was 40 years old, and he got away with it. Albeit one of those was, was killed in the farming setting before he moved into coal camps, but one was killed near the infamous Cinder Bottom. If you're familiar with Cinder Bottom, that's where, uh, that was a famous red light gambling district in McGowan County. Um, the others were killed around coal camp setting. But what I became increasingly aware of is that this family had conveyed to my generation an affinity for good guns, for example, an admiration for individuals who were highly skilled marksmen, and a sense of stand your ground no matter what. Now, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, <coughs> I knew him in, in his 80s, late 70s, 80s, but even at that age, there remained a volatility just under the surface. So a lot of me wondered about these relatives, for example, um, and their friends. Were they products of their time when they came in these early coal camps? Uh, did a particular set of circumstances guide their action? And I mentioned this sense of honor. This photograph obviously has nothing to do with early coal camps. 
when I was setting up this PowerPoint, which I'm a computer idiot, so if it gets messed up, the mic bear with me. This was taken in 1991, about two years before I left the mines. And I was thinking about that code of conduct and that sense of honor that existed among these particular individuals. And that's, you were truly standing far in the back, as uh, some of the folks from West Virginia Public Television who saw this photograph and they come and interview me on, on the project said, so, because you look like you have an attitude, well, it probably did at the time. But there is a bond and a sense of cultural codes and conduct that can only be understood by this mining group. And it's, I have a bond with those individuals that even though I've now been in the academic world for 20 years this year, I will never have with those people. I have friends and so forth, but I don't have the bond. And I don't have those elements of that culture that existed here. And that's why, why I like the photograph up there. So with all this in mind, I was contacted by Bruce Stewart, who was editing a volume uh, on violence in Appalachia. And when he contacted me about writing something regarding violence in Appalachia, he immediately mentioned labor strike. And I saw this as an opportunity. Well, now I have an excuse. I'm take a look at violence every day in coal camps. What was, what was the role of it? How, how extensive was it? And I should add, because my family's here, uh, I knew by, based on my workload I could not do the amount of research I needed to do in the period of time I had. And so I drafted Dr. Ken Bailey, who co-authored the article with me, which is here in Bloody Hills. I think it came out the end of last year or this year. I can't remember. I don't have copies of it. It's too expensive. You can actually go online and find the article if you wish. And much of what I'm going to say tonight comes from this article, no, a portion of it. Uh, some of the first stories I came across, when, when, by the way, if I'd have known how hard the research would be, I probably would have backed off this topic. Uh, but some of the first stories I came across were not necessarily hard violence against other people. They're generally amusing in retrospect. retrospect. Um, for instance, uh, if you're familiar with the Beckley area, outside of Beckley was a coal town called Cranberry and the, Cran the Cranberry Mine. When the first <clears throat> incidents I came across was an individual who only worked in the mines nominally, but also had a business in which he sold shooting powder and dynamite. Now, don't confuse those things. One does not use dynamite to shoot coal. That was never done. Dynamite is very powerful. It's used to shoot rocks in particular cases. But at any rate, he sold this to, he supplied this to the mines, and <clears throat> the suit was about damage suit he was involved with was about damage to an adjoining home. Well, it turned out that what he did was decided to have chicken for dinner, and I guess rather than chase the chicken down and wring his neck or cut, it off, cut his head off with a hatchet, he decided to shoot it with a 22. But he missed it. He hit his, his holding of dynamite and shooting powder and blew, the, blew up his building, tore up half his house and the neighbor's house, and I could not find out whether or not the chicken made it through the or not. <laughs> but those were the first things I was seeing, and I thought, well, I think I'm not going to run into a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of violence, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so I actually want to start by asking you a question as a group, and you know where I'm headed here, but with that in mind, if in American history, in American history, if where in America do you think of when you think of people being gunned down? What what part of America comes comes to mind? Arizona. Come on, ask. What if I say famous gunslinger? What do you think? Jesse James. Actually, when I ask this question, I ask this question in class, and I always have some. And still, younger students will not think too much of the Wild West. They cannot name Wild West, Hickok, or Jesse James, or they, but they will basically get the wider. Usually they will say, some wiseacre will say, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's what, it, that's what folks think of now. And as I mentioned, I expect someone to say Dodge City. And there's that, 
that popular view of folks being <clears throat> gunned down on the streets of Dodge City and elsewhere. Uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, Deadwood, South Dakota, which I do think I have up here. Uh, you think of cowboys who have an affection for their, for their weapons. Well, I got a bit of a surprise, so to speak, for you here. These are coal miners in southern West Virginia. This is not out west. This is. Deadwood, South Dakota was a dangerous place, yes. Uh, Dodge City was a dangerous place. Now, folks think of Bob Bill Hickok, his aces and ace poker hand when he's gunned down. Probably the most dangerous place out west was Bodie, California, a mining town. Keep in mind, Deadwood, South Dakota was also a mining town, not a cow town. Having said all this, now, and I knew I'd get these mixed up. You see this? Most folks will think of, of some sort of mining operation here in West Virginia. It's not. It's outside of Deadwood, South Dakota. What I'm after here are those similarities. Similarities that have not been addressed up to this time. The reality is, in the mid-1890s and early 1900s, a southern West Virginia coal miner who frequented saloons, holiday celebrations, had more chance of being gunned down along New River, the New River camps in particular, um, than a cowboy out west or even someone in Deadwood, South Dakota. This is particularly true of the camps of Rush Run, just below, just below present day Thurman, uh, Slater, a particularly dangerous coal town, coal camp, I should say, Beechwood. These early camps contained rugged individuals from a wide variety of geographical backgrounds. And they readily settled personal disputes with guns, knives, clubs, and fists. And they did not hesitate for a moment to refer to violence if they felt that they had been aggrieved. Now, it's good to keep in mind that the cow towns, once again, as I said, were not the most violent towns in the more famous American West. The mining towns were the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I knew I'd get these mixed up. Not. This is actually Deadwood, South Dakota. Looks a lot like. Southern West Virginia mining town. Uh, this is Bodie, California. This certainly, other than the floor, not being there, this looks very much like a town in, in uh, Southern West Virginia, early coal town. And again, Bodie was the most dangerous, dangerous place. Okay. The, the FBI uh, follows what's known as the FBI index which is number of homicides per 100,000 population. <coughs> uh, we mentioned Dodge City. That's usually what folks think of, cowboys and so forth. Well, Dodge, in Dodge City, during its heyday, the FBI index was 50. That means 50 killed per 100,000 population. However, the mining camp of Bodie, California, that I mentioned, had 116 homicides per 100,000 individuals. Now I'm still at work on the figures, this is still in progress, for a particular area of the of Fett County and the New River County along Slater, Beechwood, uh, not Thurman. I know that Thurman has the reputation, of course, to come through here all about how vital Thurman was. It wasn't. Thurman was a dry town. Now, what, there, there were incidents in Thurman, but it was nothing compared to what happened elsewhere. There's a little more authority that exists in Thurman, for one thing, uh, recognized authority, peace officers and so forth. But the figures are still at work. The evidence is at this point, if one takes into account the camps between Stone Cliff, which was just above Thurman, and Quinamont, which gets up near the Prince train station, at this point, what I've found is 135 homicides per 100,000 population. That means that those camps are more dangerous than if you were cow hand headed out west or working in one of the gold towns, the silver towns. Now again, I have to be cautious with those figures because at this point they don't reach professional history standards. I'm hoping I can eventually flesh it out to where it will stand and test the scrutiny. But one of the overall points is that 
when folks think of coal camp, and I think of the coal camp where I was born and so forth, you tend to think of a photograph <coughs> or this image. But here's the catch. This is a mature coal camp. It's been around a while. It's had time to establish itself, establish its infrastructure. This is what's forgotten. This is not a logging camp. This is a coal camp, truly camp. Miner's shanties, which you see here, which were rather famous at the time. A lot of transient folks coming through and staying in the shanties. I'm cheating a little bit. This is a little later coal camp, uh, really up more toward the northern part of the state, close to the period of the Depression, Great Depression. But it, it exemplifies the housing. And this is a miner's shanty uh, in one of the coal camps. These are rather rough and tumble places. What, what I'm getting at is we think of the frontier out west. Well, in southern West Virginia, in the early coal camps, not the mature ones, these, these coal mines are being established. It is a frontier, just as the west was a frontier. It may be a rural industrial frontier, but it's still a frontier all the same. And with that comes all the aspects that we think of when we think of a frontier. Uh, what one finds in these frontier settings is young single men that are on the spree, they're quick to take offense. We have men who are living in camps as bachelors away from their families. There's not a lot of entertainment at the time. Uh, and we discover the out west, for example, as those first mining strikes and so forth give way to more established companies, then things begin to settle down. You have families coming in instead of just more individual miners and so forth. Uh, and that's what happens with the mature coal camp. Things begin to settle a little bit. So I, I want to be certain that it's in your mind that what I'm talking about tonight, those first frontier type camps. Um, well, the coal camp that I was born in got a little rough even my time period on some <clears throat> occasions. But uh, that, that's a typical pattern in American history. Jamestown in early Virginia was a rough place until it gets more established and more females come in and you have much more of a family set. Uh, most of the shootouts that occur, someone is gunned down and unarmed, the same as what occurred out west despite what Hollywood shows us. Uh, now, I mentioned males here, unattached single males and so forth, but be assured tonight, we are also going to look at a couple of stories of some cold community women who proved to be what we might call quick on the draw, uh, and pretty deadly shots, I might add. Uh, and somewhat as a satellite, but, but somewhat reminding us of this frontier setting, the realities of the time period, let me do two things here. One, I'll give you a funeral story. 1903, a 25-year-old miner named Leon Thomas was a mule driver in uh, Fett's Ballinger mine. Uh, he was killed in a haulage accident. He left a wife and child who, had, who haven't quite who haven't joined him yet. But of course, they go to the train up for the funeral. Most of us can quickly draw this mental image of a horse-drawn hearse and, and so forth. But here's what's usually forgotten, especially in frontier stuff. Horses have minds of their own. So when the hearse came onto the cemetery grounds, the horses spooked. And they ran away with the hearse and the coffin. It dispersed the crowd of mourners, obviously. Everyone's running for cover. Damaged the hearse. Uh, injured both the driver, the undertaking attendant who was there. Thankfully, the coffin didn't get thrown out of the purse. And once the mourners could reassemble, the services were concluded. It's, it's a frontier setting. One more entertainment. I hope I got these in the right order. There we go. One of the, one of the more popular forms of entertainment in these cats was cat and dog fights. Now, we're talking about wild cats, not someone's tabby house cat, but wild cats, bulldogs, and so forth. And these things were, were advertised, they were, they were quite popular. 
uh, they are highly anticipated, created lots of gambling, and of course lots of drinking. And this is a report that was taken from one of the more famous fights that occurred between a cat who had killed six dogs. Now he had killed three and whipped three others before this fight. And you can see the fight had been extensively advertised for two weeks before. And so there's a big crowd present. Lots of whiskey, of course. Guns galore. Uh, and I've added in here, all was peaceful to have the contest when the melee commenced. One white man was shot through the arm. A score of others had mashed noses and broken heads. Again, it's the frontier. Folks get an argument. Someone bet on the cat, someone bet on the dog. They get an argument. <coughs> Uh, that's the way folks will get in arguments over football games and so forth. By the way, there was lots of activity by the Humane Society by 1904 trying to shut these particular fights down. Now, it is exaggerated. Uh, within this, it mentions that two black miners were killed. That's not true. Someone was shot in the army. There was a lot of, a lot of fights. This is the entertainment in this, in this set. It's also good to keep in mind these people live in a dangerous and, an act, and actually a potentially violent world. Now, again, this is the early world of coal mining. And I've talked about this in other presentations and so forth, but this is a violent world. Everything here can hurt you. The top, most miners are killed by roof falls. Most miners are going to get mangled at some, some point in their career. Uh, shooting coal is dangerous. It's hard on the body. Same is true for cowboys. We're talking about out, out west. Cowboys live in the violent world. Most of them are broken down by the time they're 30. They can't ride cattle drive to them. All the coal miners suffer from riding now. This, of course, I have worked extensively trying to find out what happened to this miner and have not been able to do so. I do believe he was killed in a roof ball, but uh, it is a dangerous world. It's a violent world. Uh, it's a world where folks have to be self-reliant. And you can see this, when I say it's a violent world, it's physically dangerous. 1886 in West Virginia, one miner for every 148 miners dies on the job. And this doesn't include those who are mangled and broken up for the rest of their lives. 1893, 212, 1900, miners. About 1903, things are getting better. I'm not real happy. I'm going to throw out the fairies. 248 miners. They work in a world where they must be self reliant. Self reliance, a, self of individ a sense of individual honor that demanded respect. It, it infused their personality. Again, just as it did cowboys out west. Now, look at this historically. Most historians have refer to the fact that miners tended to arm themselves in self-defense during labor strikes. And certainly miners were on the short end of the stick uh, and had been for quite a while. But research indicates they didn't have to arm themselves. They were already pretty well armed most of the time. Uh, firearms proliferated in the, in the coal fields. Uh, guns regularly came, came into use. You get a hot-headed individual. Uh, and they will quickly resort to violence. Uh, they, can, they can escalate hostilities during mine strike. In 1903, there was a complaint in Fed County that it was all, almost impossible to hold Sunday services because there was so much gunfire going on, people trying out their weapons on Sunday and so forth. So guns are readily available. There is, of course, a dramatic increase in population that comes into southern coal counties. And with that, there is a higher incidence of violent confrontation. Uh, by 1904, the warden of State Penitentiary, which was C.E. Haddix, Clarence Haddix, I believe was his first name, uh, Haddix reported that the five counties of Fayette, McDowell, Mercer, Kanawha, and Mingo had a combined population of 139,812. They contributed, four, four, they contributed 419 of the 748 convicts in state penitentiary in Moundsville. Just out of those five counties. Let me see what. Eh, I'm sorry. Okay. What 
they found was that of this 419, 80% of them had been involved in violent crime. Not there because they robbed someone or something of that sort. And the warden made a comparison. These 16 agricultural counties, population 205,000, 28 individuals in the Manifold Prison. Now, obviously, something's going on. There were those at the time who said, well, it's because of the increase in population. That's why, that's why we have these higher numbers of convicts. That doesn't wash. Look again, 139,000, 419 of the 700 plus convicts incarcerated at Mounds. One, one telling figure here, 1906 fail. One in every 277 individuals, most of them coal miners, were, were convicted of some, some felony. Nicholas County, which is an agricultural county, one in 6,500 convicted. Obviously something is, is going on. And it is that frontier center, plain and simple. Uh, most of these, or the vast portion of these folks coming into the coal camps, these early coal camps, were from the south, particularly Virginia, North Carolina, and eventually, of course, the African Americans who Unfortunately, got, many of them got mining experience working in the penal mines in Alabama because of southern laws at the time. Had that skill, they came up into West Virginia. Now, one of the things I've only recently discovered uh, was that African Americans from Alabama and African Americans from North Carolina and Virginia to some extent had a natural animosity toward each other. And that led to problems. What I had anticipated that I would, would find when this research began, and Dr. Ben and I started working on it, was that there would be violent crimes, let's say native-born white Americans versus African Americans, or versus Italians, or versus Hungarians, or whatever the case may be. But that's not the way it worked out. Instead, it tended to be Italian against Italian, native-born white against native-born white, black against black and so forth. There were exceptions, but overall, that tended to be, it tended to be violence within the particular group. <coughs> uh, the vast majority of, of these violent episodes, once again, occurs within the cultural group itself. One of, one of the other things that also surprised me was the number of people who, who genuinely cold-blooded murdered, the, whether they be black, Italian, white, Hungarian, and don't go to the gallows, surprise me. And then occasionally, when someone who does go to the gallows, I, I'm a bit puzzled. I say, well, that crime didn't look nearly as bad as the other. Um, but there is, in this situation, once again, an abundance of liquor, uh, a proliferation of firearms. Firearms are easy to get, but lots of liquor. The one co-official, future co-official, John J. Lincoln, commented that when he was making his way to Pope Hans, Virginia, he was in McDowell County, and his train was, sat, was sidetracked and delayed for quite a while so that a train full of alcohol could make its way up into McDowell County. Co-operators, particularly individuals such as Justice Collins and some others, I won't go into who Collins is, I will only say that, oh, he's a despicable guy. They, they believe that liquor should be supplied to miners so that they get it on a regular basis. Therefore, they'd be less likely to bend when they had when they had, were, had it available. And it didn't work out there. They'd bend anyway. But uh, Lincoln mentioned the fact of the gambling uh, and so forth, the, the lower element that came into the camps. Think about that for a moment. We mentioned Deadwood, South Dakota, Dodge City, Kansas. If you are, if you tend to be naturally a, a natural criminal in some way, where are you going to go? You're going to go where you can steal the money. If you're a professional gambler, you're going to go where you can win it or steal it, whatever the case may be. And that's what comes into these coal, coal camps as well, professional gamblers. Uh, those who are, have criminal tendencies of one sort or another. Uh, Lincoln was particularly, John Lincoln was particularly 
um, interested in the arrival of all these professional gamblers. Uh, he also mentioned, he said, several weekend passes that there's not, someone doesn't die from not shooting dead. Uh, the magistrates at the time tried to uh, impose anti-pistol laws. And there was a law in place that it's illegal to carry a pistol, but no one really pays, pays any attention to it. Plus, the level of violence, the level of court cases, far exceeds the ability of the infrastructure to deal with it. For that matter, the prosecuting attorney by 1900 in McDowell County is complaining that he cannot prosecute the coal mine safety violations because he doesn't have the staff to do it, he doesn't have the funding to do it. You add all these, these criminal activities going on, they just can't keep up with it. It, it overwhelms the infrastructure. Uh, there's <clears throat> Fed County, for example, there's such a strain on the system that by 1891, the state splits the courts. Instead of just being one, one court, they have a criminal court and then a civil court to deal with lawsuits and that sort of thing because the criminal court is overwhelmed. The reality is, despite, <clears throat> and some folks are going to bristle a little bit at this, I'm sure, despite the popular perceptions, Mingo County during the heyday, let's say, of the one Massacre and so forth, is a Sunday school picnic compared to Fayette County by the late 1800s and very early 1900s. There are more people killed for each court docket than die in the Maitwan Massacre or in any of the strike violence down in Mingo County uh, combined. It's, it, I was amazed by it. Uh, but the West Virginia State Supreme Court is going to find themselves pressured to make decisions on, on this level of violence they've never, they've never been experienced before. Uh, the state's chief executive, the governor, they are, they are overwhelmed with petitions for a variety of uh, commute to sentence, pardon people, and so forth. And going through governor's papers, I, I was astounded at the number of letters they received, people asking for a pardon of some sort. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Bailey and I discovered very early on that really caught us by surprise, and I, now that I think of it, it shouldn't have, I mentioned alcohol, and there was lots of it. But one of the other aspects of this was the widespread use of cocaine, late 1890s, <coughs> early 1900s. Now, most folks will say, well, wait a minute. That's a later 20th century malady, so to speak. Not so. Cocaine was, was easily obtainable at the time. Uh, lots of folks uh, made use of it. You could buy it from peddlers. Uh, it was not regulated in any way. So you had drinking, drugs to some extent, but the drinking is enough. And you have a ball to mix. Uh, carrying a pistol, the fine at the time, was if you were caught, was $25. Now, most folks would say, wait a minute, $25? That's the minimum fine. Uh, that's not very much, but what you have to do with these things is put them in today's dollar. So $25 in, let's say, 1903, 1904, would be $657 today. Uh, another way to think of it is 95 cents in 1904 is $25 today. So the minimum fine was, was $25. That could be a substantial, substantial fine for most folks. Uh, but it's, Many folks were fine. Women that carried weapons for protection received sentences <coughs> under the law. Uh, even coal company officials, which was a surprise to me, I admit. Even though they had often had powerful political connections, they found themselves reported for violating the pistol law. Uh, one, of the, one of the episodes that really surprised me was an individual who was a superintendent of one of the mines in Fayette County of the most powerful co-operator, the most powerfully politically connected individual in Fayette County, Samuel Dixon. Uh, this, my, this mine superintendent was fined for carrying a pistol on coal company land within the coal can. Now, I, I was shocked by it. It's, it's privately owned. It's owned by the coal company. But he still paid the $25 fine. And the only reason he had the pistol in his coat 
was he had to euthanize the mule that broke its leg. And then he was just walking back home. Uh, James K. Lang, who was part of the very powerful Lang family, uh, powerful co-operators. And initially, one of the Langs would be uh, uh, chief of part of mine. Uh, he's fine for carrying a pistol. Um, but in terms of the more violent episodes, uh, we found that, for example, James Kearney, 1901, he's a coal miner who gets into an argument uh, about the ownership of a pair of shoes with a fellow miner from Turkey Knob. If you're familiar with the Fed County area, Turkey Knob was between Glenjean and Mount Hope along Dunlop Creek. It's a little closer to the Mount Hope, so it's a rather large place. <coughs> and this, this argument that Kearney had was with H.P. Watts, and Watts was, um, had gone out and purchased 38 caliber Ivory and Johnson revolver. And these folks know revolvers and quality quite well. And some heated words resumed uh, that evening when they met at the boarding house. And so this is the way these shootings tend to happen. Watts, who has his 38 caliber revolver, he's in, he invites Kearney. He says, all right, we'll settle this. Let's go outside. Kearney's thinking, well, OK. Or Watts is thinking, OK, we're going to go out here and go at it. Fist and knives, whatever the case may be. What Watts does, he waits till Kearney walks out into the yard. Or excuse me, he waits. Kearney waits till walks, Watts walks out into the yard and then just shoots him in the back and kills him. Uh, these males have an intense attraction to weapons. Uh, some have some historians have suggested it came out of that Civil War, post-Civil War era of violence. Uh, Southerners in the post-Civil War period. Uh, had a fascination with guns, most young rural people do anyway. Uh, stories of what's going on out west <laughs> filter back to the east, and it gets built into thinking of young folks at the time. And lots of those southerners are coming into the coal camps. Uh, miners did occasionally actually engage in actual stereotypical dime novel shootouts. Usually what would happen, and I found several cases of this, Miners tended to carry pistols in, the, in their pockets. And so an argument would ensue, and they would try to get the pistol out of the pocket as fast as they could. And in at least three cases, what I found was the individual trying to pull the pistol out of his pocket really fast drops it. It's all hooked up in his trousers and so forth. So his opponent actually reaches down and picks up the pistol. He's a little quicker and shoots him with his own pistol. Yeah. Uh, but there was one case. Two black miners in 1902, James Freeman and Charles Brown, they argued over a woman with whom they boarded. boarded. Uh, and through mutual agreement, these two individuals met outside the boarding house of Rush Run on a Sunday in the street, such as it was there at Rush Run. And they conducted a draw and fire gunfight that resulted in Brown's death. They actually squared off in the street, just like a Hollywood movie, went for their guns, and one killed the other. Uh, there was an admiration for constables, for example, who, uh, and peace officers and others who, having been shot as they were going down, actually shot uh, the, the criminal or their opponent somewhat. Folks admired them. But as I mentioned about Fed County, there's, and I kind of skipped over this, but in 1909, Fed German reported on an upcoming criminal court term. And the headline was, an exceptionally large docket for even Fed County. <laughs> you know, this is being on the normal 19 murder cases. There are 17 murder cases per docket. This is up around 27 or so. Uh, the firearms, the appeal of liquor, it makes taverns in the smokeless, smokeless coal fields the principal size of gunplay. And if you were a tavern keeper, if you were a bartender, you had to be a tough customer to manage uh, these intoxicated, gun-toting patrons. And there were lots of gunfights that occurred between those who, who ran a saloon and their patrons. It happened often. Actually, Dr. Bailey and I opened the article with a shootout in a saloon in Rush Run. But, there were saloons that had, there were popular names of saloons. Red Rabbit is a very popular name of the saloon. There's one in Carbondale, one in Scarborough, 
and knowing what I know about the red rabbits from only in Scarborough and in Fayette County, Carbondale and Fayette County, if I was armed with an AK-47, I wouldn't go into places. Uh, it was constant. There was constant confrontation. This is a story that I'm going to use to, to as an example for this, uh, saloon keepers and so forth. That's not in the original article. It's, it's actually part of something I'm doing now for West Virginia History Journal. Uh, and it's, it's always difficult because if you get too many names, then it's hard to follow what happened. An individual with the last name of McCoy who, was, who talked about the fact that he was from Kentucky and you got to watch out for these McCoys. You know, there's still that whole business of Hatfields and McCoys and people's minds where the pop, <coughs> popper's time. Uh, his friend Hackett and some others. At a coal camp, a true camp for sure, at a place called Dairy Hill. If you are familiar once again with Fayette County and you drive from Glen Jean where the National Park headquarters is at to Mount Hope, about one mile out of Glen Jean, you will top a hill, and you, all you will see now is a sign that says Dairy Hill Road. Dairy Hill Road. And one time that was a very extensive coal camp. <clears throat> Fairly close, about a mile from Glen Jean. McCoy had gone down to the Dairy Hill Saloon. And he got involved in actually helping behind the bar. And his two friends come in. At some point, they're talking about these three miners are talking about, and the place is quite busy, it's a Saturday night, they're talking about uh, the benefit or the advantages of their cold pistol versus an Ivor Johnson pistol and so forth. And they go outside and they engage in some target practice, and by then it's getting dark. Well, some time passed, and someone ran down to Glen Jean and said to the, told the Justice of the Peace, they said, there's been a shooting up at the Dairy Hill Saloon. And someone's dead. The Justice of the Peace could not find his assigned constable, nor could he, it was very common at the time, to actually appoint someone as a special constable, even if they didn't know what they were doing. So the Justice of the Peace himself goes up there, and he goes in the saloon, they're still drinking, but the regular bartender's not there, the guy who actually owns the club. McCoy's serving drinks, and so the Justice of the Peace says, has someone been shot up here? I don't know, I don't guess. And he said, well, where is so-and-so? He said, back sleeping, I suppose. He said, is he sleeping or is he dead? McCoy said, well, no, I guess he's dead. <laughs> so they shot the guy, carried him to the back room, threw him on the bed, and went on drinking this. <laughs> now, it's a very complicated case, and I've actually been sitting back at one of these tables uh, about this summer, but shortly before, reading the trial transcript over and over, trying to make sense of it. What, what I'm getting at here is this whole concept. Someone's been gunned down and they go right on drinking. Uh, most miners need no real excuse to consume large amounts of alcohol this time, but um, holidays, July 4th celebrations and so forth, they tend to really get wound up. And this individual that I'm about to mention has fascinated me from the earliest research when we came across him. His name, he was a black miner by the name of Funston Cox. Funston was a skilled blacksmith. And evidently a rugged character to say the least. Uh, he got in trouble very early on when he came into Fayette County. He spent some time in chain gang. He serves his time. He, he's, he's back working as a blacksmith at Sewell, which is right on the New River, if you're familiar with the New River area. And, <clears throat> During a July 4th celebration, there is a story is floating around that two black miners are about to have a gunfight. So an individual appoints himself as a special constable. Remember the constable, if you're not aware, constable was the peace officer affiliated with the Justice of the Peace. Well, this guy just appoints himself, fell by the end of the blood. Long and short of it is, a gun battle erupts, Lusk is killed, Cox is wounded by Lusk's brother, and Cox has to recuperate before they can even try him. He is tried for first degree murder. Uh, he is convicted, recommended life imprisonment, not execution. But the, he definitely, without getting into details, he definitely had not had a fair trial. He had not had a fair show. And William Dawson, governor's time, March 1908, he paroles Cox. 
for the good time he's already served, even though he'd only served what was called fairly good. And he said, hey, but he warned. Cox is hot, hot headed, so he has to refrain from getting into trouble once he's partner. He goes right back to life in prison. Well, Cox violated the law once again. He's put on a chain gang before he's sent back to before he's going to be sent back to Mansfield, and he escapes. This guy's quite a character. And disappears. He was never caught. And I could not track him down, I track, desperately track him down. Uh, but there were young miners committed such uh, such acts, and this one, this particular story had quite an effect on me when, when we were doing the research. Two young miners, uh, I'll just give you the last names, Young and Tyler. They had gone, they had left Beechwood. Again, Beechwood was a, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, oh, it wasn't. Beechwood's not on here, but it, and I'm sorry, I should have come over to Much of what I'm talking about is this area along the river. You can see Kmor, which is popular in public history today. Or, Park Service and so forth. But Red Ash, Rush Ryan, I mentioned, Stone Cliff, Thurman is here. If you go up toward Oak Hill along White Oak Creek and then on the Arbuckle Creek, the hotbed violent areas of Scarborough and Windgrove and uh, Dairy Hill and so forth. Uh, but they had left, they had left Beachwood, they walked to Thurman and to spend the day. Uh, probably, based on what happened, probably purchased some cocaine. I'm not positive. Can't pin that down. But based on what happened, it sure seemed like they definitely had been drinking quite a bit by the time they got back to Beachwood. And I have to use the first name now. Mike Young, Ed Tyler. Tyler had become quite drunk, so he gave his revolver to Young on the return trip. Then they get they return to Beachwood, they're standing in front of the Beachwood Company store, and two start to argue. Young insists that Tyler, uh, that he doesn't have six dollars of Tyler's money. A scuffle ensues, the pistol fell to the ground, Young grabbed it, stepped back, and fired a round into Tyler. And again, these are very young individuals. Tyler's wounded, and he staggers to the steps of the company store. He is standing to the porch and he sits down. And the witnesses, who all ran into the company store, and they mentioned, they said that, they said that uh, Young was behaving like a demon. That's a direct quote. Possibly because of drugs. You can say, for sure. But Young paces back and forth on the porch and he threatens to shoot anyone who interferes. And he continues his tirade and then at one point, Tyler says, don't shoot me anymore. He's sitting on the steps. Young you know, ignores the appeal, places the muzzle of the weapon against Tyler's head, pulls the trigger twice, and the pistol misfires. <laughs> Third attempt, revolver discharges, killed Tyler instantly. Still crazed, Young fires even another round into the body, and then he flees. I have, <clears throat> I have looked at everything I could about this case and why he did not get the gallows, I do not understand. But he did not. The jury returned a first degree murder ver verdict, but life imprisonment in the penitentiary. Uh, extreme alcoholism was often tried. They tried to use it as, as self-defense, uh, which sometimes they almost got by with it, but not too often. Um, you might. It might surprise you to know that some people brought suit, women in particular, brought suit against the owners of taverns for uh, supplying too much liquor to their husbands. Now that's something we think about in modern times, but it was tried in 1900 and early. Uh, I'm trying to skip ahead, I'm running out of time. Uh, there were, <clears throat> I need to sort of address this issue of jurisprudence here. Um, one incident that occurred that, that lends itself to this change in jurisprudence and, and political or legal philosophy at the time was when a young miner, well just, the young miner is accosted on payday by one of the local ruffian miners, someone who's kind of tough, has a reputation for being tough. And this young mill driver, he's just he's a youth. He's sitting on the porch with some of his friends there in, in the coal camp, 
eating a watermelon. He's not bothering anyone. But he's accosted by this thug, basically. Eventually, he gets pushed against the wall. Now, he can't handle this, this guy physically. So, in desperation, at last, he pulls a pistol and kills his assailant. He is found guilty of murder and sent to the prison. But the governor at the time, Governor William Glasscock, steps into this and he says, wait a minute. We have to look at this whole concept of English law and, and legal philosophy. And West Virginia is going through that change at the time, change from no duty to retreat. That had been the concept most of the time out west, early on in the coal camps. In other words, I don't have to step back. If I'm confronted, I can react. That's legal. Well, that had begun to change, and it had changed to back against the wall. From a legal standpoint, one had to be forced and have no where they can retreat. They had tried everything to get away from them. In fact, that's what this young miner had done, and Glasscock said, he's going to be pardoned, and he was pardoned. But the law is in, is in flux at the time. If you step back to 1884, and I remember this distinctly setting one of the tables back there going through Secretary of State pardon papers. I came, I came across <clears throat> a pardon issued by Governor Jackson. And this wasn't re related to coal, uh, coal country, but it's, it, has, it has some importance. A farmer had come home and found his wife sitting at the table with apparently an individual who she had been uh, carrying on an affair with, and apparently the farmer knew it. He came, he came in, he saw this individual sitting at his kitchen table, he shot and killed him. And he was found guilty and sent to prison. Governor Jackson pardoned him, and the governor said, he has a right to protect his hearth and his home, and that is protection of his home. If he shoots, they cut all the setting at the kitchen table, well, the guy got what was coming to him. Now, this, this legal system in flux is changing throughout this time period of these coal miners and so forth. I did say I mentioned the women, and this is one of my favorite. Uh, this is a saloon at Peril, which is present day Summer League, 1909, I believe. Uh, saloon in McDowell County. Coal company built this, built it quickly to supply <coughs> liquor. Uh, full room either in Glen Jean or full room gambling house, not necessarily a drinking house, Glen Jean, uh, possibly, uh, possibly third room of the country. The women. Now, <laughs> look at these ladies. You can tell that they could possibly be a little rough around the edges. And one, one of the things I found, which didn't make its way into the article, when I mentioned it several times, this is particularly true of, the, of Italian females. It seemed, based on what I've come across, and I've seen more of that recently since that article, the Italian women seemed to like shotguns and did not hesitate to turn shotguns on husbands that endangered them in some way or just irritated them once too often. <laughs> But the women would resort to violence uh, in self-defense or as a means of resolving problems. Mining camp, Carbondale, Fick County. Uh, Fanny Washington, this is in the article, it's a really interesting case. She was spying through the keyhole door on her husband. Her husband apparently was trying to perform an abortion on her daughter by a previous marriage. Now, obviously, something had been going on between the husband and and the daughter. According to Fanny Washington's story, Clay Washington, the husband, started ch saw her and started chasing her, broke through the door and was chasing her, and as she ran out, ran from him out the house to get out the door, according to her, she, there was a Colt pistol laying on the table and she had bumped it as she went by and it fell off in the floor and shot and killed her. <laughs> 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 it worked. The story worked. That's that's. She never went to trial because what are folks going to think at the time? Well, yeah, if all this is true, well then he got what was coming to. Uh, 
They're intoxicated males, of course, could become the victims of, and I want to uh, please dispel this observation that's sometimes made, that all boarding houses were prostitution houses. That is balderdash. Boarding houses were quite, com quite common. It was a way to uh, supplement the income at the time. Uh, in 1898, there in McDowell County, several women working in the area, they took advantage of a coal miner. He had wages with him, so drug him a little bit. He goes to sleep, uh, and that uh, we will rob him. It's payday. It's been payday and so forth. And unfortunately, they gave him too many drugs, and he died. And of course, that leads to a murder charge. But also, uh, one of the more popular stories that I came across, and I really investigated this, but didn't make it in the original article. It'll probably be in the next one coming out. But there was a black woman standing on at the train station in Carbondale, just above Montgomery there, it was just above Montgomery, waiting on a train. And down from her was an individual who was harassing her, saying rather lewd things to her and so forth. And finally she just had enough of it. She pulls out a pistol. He's about 55 feet away. Now with a pistol, that's a pretty, pretty serious shot. Shot him right above the ear and right through the head. She got she only got two years. Why? Because she was being harassed by a male. That male was breaking a cultural code. She could easily say she felt threatened. Her back may not have been against the wall, but at the evening, a woman standing alone at the train station, she's somewhat, she's somewhat open to, to being attacked. Uh, prostitutes, of course, became the victims of crown themselves. Uh, one of the more famous cases I'm working on now, or more interesting cases, is, is an individual, Jesse Briggs, who was an African-American coal buyer. He killed a, a gentleman sitting with the woman that apparently he loved, Mary Young. He simply walked in the house, said, Mary, you've done me wrong. She's sitting with this, this other man, and it opens fire. It seemed he would go to the gallows, but he did not. But what I have discovered is Mary Young apparently is a fairly tough customer. She had been knifed only six months before she was shot. And she had been involved in using a knife on some miners as well. Uh, I want to, so, so leave it at that again. Uh, these women apparently can drink with the best of them or else they're just posing for this. But the case that has haunted me, so to speak, from day one, uh, is the case of Ludden Madison. Now, let's see if I can. I doubt that this will. That came out better than I thought. This is a letter. And boy, there was this a chore to track this down. I used every bit of detective skill I had before I found it out. This is a letter from Ludden Madison on death row, basically, at Moundsville. Uh, to Governor White, you can see 1901. Crime commit was committed in 1899. Now, remember those mighty miners' shanties I talked about. Uh, Lud Madison was in this miners' shanty, in the a fairly quiet individual, work hard worker, with three other miners. And one evening, himself and an individual, apparently according to the trial, although they would not let him come out in, in the trial. An individual named Peter Swader. Swader apparently was a fairly tough customer and had a reputation. Lud Madison, who if, if I remember right, is 21 at the time. Swader's a little older. They, they were playing checkers. At the end of the checker game, they got up to go to bed and they talked about the fact they just put new straw in the bed, so that's the kind of setting they're in. And Swader says, I'd like to have some bread. <clears throat> and Lud Madison, who apparently had baked the bread, said, if you want bread, bake it yourself. And Swader, who's outside a bit, uh, toward the outside door, and he's getting ready to lay down the night, says, <sighs> okay, forget the language, says, well, I don't want your goddamn bread then. Now, anyone who's been around a laboring world 
note that the cardinal sin, the way that you can take something to a violent confrontation, is to curse at someone else. You can get angry, you can raise your voice to an extent, but if you use curse words, most likely something's going to happen, especially among coal miners. Lud Madison. Lud Madison sits down, writes a letter to his mother. And he had simply remarked to Swayer, don't you cuss me. He wrote a letter to his mother, gave it to his friend, and left. He went out and procured a pistol. He came back to the miner's shanty, stepped through the front door, shot Swayer in the bed twice. He makes his way to Hinton where he's caught. Now they bring him back, the constable finally gets up to Hinton. Uh, he probably hopped a train uh, and made his way to Hinton. Uh, the constable brings him back horseback. This is 1899. It's a long trip. And he's got Madison on the back. He's not cuffed or anything. He just ran him on the back of the horse and they're talking about it the whole way. Well, the things Madison said were used against him in court. He told, he told the constable, he said, well, it'll go easier on, on you if you admit it. And he said, Why'd you shoot him? He said, because I told him not, because he cussed me. The trial itself broke down this way, although there's some disagreement about it. The judge, this case came up on the docket, Madison, well, Madison didn't have an attorney. There was an attorney who was working the case before, and when, and when that case ended, the judge said, he ordered that this attorney take Madison's case. And, the, and the, the only defense that Madison gets is they go in a room in the Fayette County Courthouse, they discuss it for an hour, they come out, and the trial begins. And the trial goes far into the night. They, should break for, they may break for dinner, but they just, they just kept going. These things were marathon sessions. Madison gets the death penalty. And this is written from death row. Again, it's two years later. They didn't, there wasn't a lot of time between getting a death penalty and going to gallows at the time. But there's lots of appeals to Governor A.B. White at the time. So wait a minute, this guy didn't get a fair trial. Uh, so his sentence, beginning with Governor Atkinson and then Governor White, his sentence, he gets a reprieve. And so a couple times he's one hour from the gallows. When the reprieve comes in, twice. Third time, it's one day that he gets a stay of execution. I shouldn't use the term reprieve, I apologize. He gets a stay of execution. In the meantime, they bring Madison back to Fayette County because the date of his execution has passed, and so sentence has to be passed once again. But when he gets to Fayette County, they say, there's nothing we can do. According to our records, he's dead. He was executed in 1899. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy is caught in this whole, in this whole confusion. So this letter comes toward the end of his stage mouthful. And I sort of highlighted these. You will recall me by name, if you can see that up there, as the man who in the eyes of the law is dead. But... I'm alive, in flesh, suffering untold agony. Obviously untold agony. He keeps, he's almost ready for the gallows, continue. Dead, but yet alive with all the uncertainty. You can imagine, time and again, you're about to go to the gallows. Uh, he mentions the terrible mental distress, uh, the position he's in, and, and this really caught my eye. Down toward the bottom there. He's living a nightmare in daylight, and a demon, he's living with demons in the darkness because he just doesn't know what's going to happen. Fayette County keeps saying he's dead already. We're not stepping in on this thing. Uh, ask the governor, you can see by the second page, place, your, place yourself in my position. And he's talking about me as merit maker and so forth. I beg you for mercy. Finally, A.B. White actually commutes the sentence to life instead of execution. Madison uh, dies in the Mountville Penitentiary within five years. I want you to look at the figures once again. He's dead in five years. Any idea what disease 
is most common in Dr. Bain asked them, what disease was most common in Moundsville and killed most most folks who died it or died from this? Syphilis. Ooh, very good. Most syphilis. Tuberculosis was quite common and took, and, and, uh, took a lot of lives. But, uh, now we just touched on this, and, and again, if you look for Blood in the Hills online, you can find that chapter and read it if you want some more details about it. But once again, these, these are the frontier coal camps. Don't take it into the more, more mature coal camps. Uh, overall, what it means is the experience of these people in these early coal camps is similar to boom towns everywhere else in the nation. Uh, there's not anything that's distinctive about it because it's Appalachian, or because it's coal country. It just follows a rather common frontier path. Thanks a lot. It's hurting your If there are questions, I'll do my best to answer them if I can. Yeah, maybe Dr. Bailey can. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Bailey, did Fay County have a sheriff or a shot? Uh, yes. Daniel? Uh, Nehemiah Daniel. Uh, they killed Montgomery by a coal mine. You're right. It was uh, being a constable. Uh, lots of constables were gunned down. And lots of what they call special constables were assigned there. But uh, everyone, that's, everyone that you're going to come up against is probably going to be Army. And Daniel just happened to drop his guard for a long time. But you're right, because he was killed by a coal mine. And I think that guy, he, got, he didn't get the death sentence, right? The guy that killed the sheriff? He did. He did, he did yes. He did get the death sentence? He did get the death penalty, but I think he was commuted. I'd have to check. Yeah, I think he got out. I think there yeah. was a big controversy about where he came from. It happened down in Montgomery. Right. It was in Montgomery. And actually, one of the last lynchings that took place took place in Montgomery. When an individual was taken off the train there. Yes, ma'am. Um, when did the coal mine start in this area? Okay. If you're back behind. In, in, the, in the 1880s, actually what opened the coal fields in southern West Virginia, uh, in this area, was the CNO Railroad that came through uh, in 1870, very early 1870. That, that opened those coal mines along the, the main route of the railroad. And so from that main route, they began to expand up different hollows and so forth. So 18, 1880s was beginning to really take off. 1890s. Places such as Cabin Creek, Paint Creek are open up. Yeah, you know, I didn't mention that along Cabin Creek, Kanawha County is trying to, you now, of course, Kanawha County is not all coal. They have so much, it's been established with, with a tighter infrastructure for quite a while. And so there are so many shootings along Cabin Creek in particular in saloons that they they refused, early 1900s, they refused. They said, that's it. There will be no more liquor license. You had to have a license to sell liquor. There will be no more li liquor license issued for the Cabin Creek area. No. For anything outside of Charleston. So on the last night that those liquor licenses, the liquor could be sold under those licenses, what happens? They have a murder up at Mammoth. The sort of punch went, yes, you need to actually pull those liquor licenses. Cabin Creek could be quite violent. Paint Creek, of course, uh, Mammoth, uh, Gallatin Hall. So it's not just Fed County. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, in gun laws, local gun laws at that time, was there a distinction between a concealed weapon and carrying a rifle or a pistol in a holster? I don't think so, was it, Ken? No. It was simply illegal to carry a weapon. Uh, Knives of, of uh, certain types of knots, certain types of knives, you could not carry them in public. Even certain types of billy clubs as well, right? Billy clubs of riding. Everybody did it, but it was illegal. And if it was seen, oftentimes you get that $25 fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, there's a Chinese community at the time. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. There was one of the things that's not known, which comes a little later, by the 1930s and 40s, was, and that's a good question because they were so prevalent out west, they were actually excellent mining. Um, I was surprised to learn actually from my father, who had many friends in the Mexican section of the coal camp at Oakwood, Carlisle, which is near present day Scarborough. And so I was 
somewhat surprised by that. Just for my curiosity, what section of the coal camp do you think you have the last piece? Well, I can't. Obviously, Mexican miners are going to be placed in the same area of the coal camp as African American miners, which is at least desirable. Yes, sir. Uh, about when did the uh, change in uh, coal mining history? Uh, was it in, when was it mostly influenced by the great influence of in, influx of, of uh, immigrants from various European countries, and how did that change what you're talking about, individual gunfights and violence, as opposed to? what occurred in the coal fields when we had great influence and influx of miners from Romania, from Italy, from various parts of Europe, who suddenly poured into the coal fields because of the need for labor? That's a really good question. Um, what you'll find is it, it varies in, in, in different areas. Uh, for instance, Italians, this is well known, they quickly come into the Boomer area in Big County, right outside of Montgomery. One of, the first, one of the first crimes where someone goes to the house I come across is an intoxicated individual who kills uh, an, an elderly. They said elderly, 54, that's young to me, but uh, <laughs> that he had killed, uh, killed an Italian there in, in the room. Uh, again, it, it varies. Now, one of the ways it does affect uh, the later, as these coal camps, as the coal camps are maturing, one of the ways it does have an influence is that many of those immigrants tend to bring their family with them. And families tend to, that family setting tends to lessen this confrontation that you have among single, single men and so forth. But uh, most camps in Fayette County in particular, very early, it tends to be Southerners, and some folks come from Pennsylvania. The, and the Hungarians and others tend to come a little bit late as the camps are beginning to mature. But again, it, it depends. Those areas I mentioned above, uh, Thurman and so forth, such as Beechwood or, or Slater in particular, those are coal camps that are violent for 15 years and then are just gone. So what I, I guess what I'm getting is I can't act definitively answer your question and say, well, in this particular area, Lots of Italians and Hungarians and Russians and so forth are coming in, so things settle down. It just depends on the given area and what sort of mix of people you get. Is that sort of, I've danced around a little bit, but mostly because I can't answer it definitively. But I would speculate somewhat that immigrants coming in with their families are going to tend to bring uh, an ameliorating influence on this, on this body. I would think it'd be a huge increase in the population of those coal camps because of the need for labor. At some point in the early 20th century, which might have had some influence on what people were going to this history. It does. Even, even in the United States, <coughs> uh, particularly in, in areas where you have industrial operations such as steel and so forth, and immigrants are pouring into those areas, there is a movement afoot folks are saying, well, some of the, the social problems we are having in Pittsburgh and elsewhere is because immigrants drink too much. Compared to what? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the folks I've been talking about here tonight were native-born Americans from the South. But um, much of that type, many of those immigrants who come in will also lean toward violence. When, when, there's, when that recognized, established authority is not around, and it takes a while to, to put that in place, to make where you don't have transit work. Where, even if I'm Italian or Hungarian, I'm working at, let's say, Oakwood Mine in Fake County, and I learned that not only can I work at a better place, but I'm going to be paid a little more time down at Wingram. I'm going to pack it to go down. So for a while, the, even the immigrants are somewhat of a transient population. And that matures at different times and different places. Good question, great question. In all the research that you've done about uh, coal camp violence, did you ever come across how did the temperance movement affect the, 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 well, the 
temperance movement it certainly is underway in West Virginia. And of course, West Virginia actually passed the prohibition before it's passed uh, at the national level. And there were those, you're right, there were those who were, who were prohibitionists at the time uh, who were saying, look at what's going on in Fayette County, in Gallup County, in Southern West Virginia. See, we need to outlaw consumption of alcohol. And it's safe to say that what's happening in these southern counties, in these coal camps, speed along that passage of um, West Virginia Prohibition. And actually, Ken addressed that more than I did. Is that fair in what I said, Ken? Yeah, 1912. 1912? Yeah, I said 1914. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it true that a coal miner got hurt? And while he was recovering, but not making any money, and was getting behind in his rent of a company house and a wife, would go to the company store and have to go upstairs and want to Oh, God. <laughs> no. No. Plain and simple, no. Now, I know where the story comes from. I was born. Now, listen. I was born in sight of the Whipple Company store. All my, all my relatives, my grandmother and others who shopped at the Whipple Company store, would go into orbit. They would be pulling out their pistols if they heard this. <laughs> Did, were there cases where, I'm going to be careful I say this, were there cases where possibly some female, this happened in my time, I haven't said, but, were there cases where some female took advantage of possibly getting funds because it was something she tended to do anyway? I don't doubt that it happened. But under no circumstances can it, is, is there any solid evidence that a wife or a minor was forced into prostitution because they could not pay their rent. Or something. It does not exist. And those who... Oh boy. Those, uh, <laughs> it, uh, well, it's these these legends that get in. Uh, okay, and again, my grandmother, she's running the call anyway. She could, she could bring chickens next in each hand. I never could. All I could do was torture chickens. But uh, 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 they, <coughs> the, this people who are saying they remember this. Well, wait a minute. If this happened in the early stages of Whipple, for example, there is nobody living now that could remember that period of time. Whipple was established in the 1890s. New River takes it over in the early 1900s. And I know that never happened with New River. I know that story's out there, but until someone can show me absolute documented, professional level solid evidence, no. I'm glad my mom's not alive either. She would flip down with that. Yes, sir. <laughs> With some of the comparisons, excuse me, with some of the comparisons that you made at the beginning of the lecture, comparing the coal tent, the coal camps to places like Deadwood and Dodge City and Tombstone, places like that, why have they gotten all the pop cultural attention? Because you would think, the way the American public is, that they would love a good story about a violent coal camp. Why do they get all of the attention and the, the coal camps, that story is largely gone untold? That's a good question. I'm not sure I can answer it, other than the fact that what was occurring out west hits, hits the scene in the 1870s and 1880s, and the place that the journalists can imply their trade is happening out west. It's also a little more romantic. Horses, uh, and lots of these miners read these dying, dying novels and so forth. And you know, you look at the handwriting of someone like Blood Madison, <laughs> they're quite literate. That's, that's the only, I've thought about that question myself. Uh, it's also, I suppose one could, could look at the fact that what's occurring, what occurred out west during the 1870s and 1880s and so forth uh, is, is at a period of time before that full-blown industrialization of the United States and, and West Virginia it, and other coal regions that are just opening up are seen as more part of that industrial complex than they are that, that frontier. Is that, and I'm, I'm skipping a little bit. Yes? Have you seen the pictures of the saloons in Lynn Jean? 
Yes, I had because Clarence, you couldn't tell you where to look. At <laughs> That's it. You're right. You're exactly right. You can they have their slippers and they have their little back and the whole bit. and and they're what they're doing is in many ways is copying what they knew about these famous gunmen out west and so on. Um, Was there a figure like that in the coal camps? That sort of Wild Bill, uh, Doc Holliday type of figure. The name is sketching. John Kincaid, for one, but I'm trying to think. Ken, do you remember the famous lawman that uh, Tams talked about? I can't remember his name. I almost got it. Oh, you don't mean Dan Cunningham. No, it wasn't Dan, Dan Cunningham. It was rather famous. But yes, I, yes, it's, they are known um, more locally. And it's only because someone like Ned Buntline and somebody did come by and write write stories about it. Yeah. Uh, I think that you really really touched on earlier when you said you mentioned media attention in the West. Uh, basically, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, there was a huge amount of public attention on the Indian wars that were occurring in the plains. And, and great uh, some of the great Civil War heroes like Phil Sheridan, who fought the Indians after the Civil War was in the news all the time. So the Western frontier was the focus of the media, and particularly the fact that the Transcontinental Railroad, everybody was focused on the fact that they were building a railroad from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so there was a huge focal point of, 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 of attention. That plus the fact that they had to defeat the Plains Indians in order to be successful. Whereas Appalachia was such a remote area so little communication, such poor publicity, that very few people really in the rest of the country knew what was going on in Bingo County, Fayette County. That's just my take on it. Yeah, and you're right. You know, it's, it's interesting that by the 1880s, there are individuals who are, you know, let's say 1890, folks get concerned because it has been determined the frontier is gone, and the frontier is what made America. Right? So there are people who go out and start looking for that frontier culture. And where do they think they find it? In Appalachia. And so the publications that do come out about Appalachia are not about, about the, the coal industry, because that's seen as modernity. What they're about is this lost culture that exists up there in the mountains, which you know, is exaggerated and so forth. And you move into those those uh, volumes such as uh, Trail of Lonesome Pine and so forth. So what is being written, you're right, what is being written about the Appalachian region tends to be about this lost people that speak a, that speak a form of English that hasn't been spoken since the 1600s and so forth. Very so. good. Yes. Thank you very much for attending our lecture tonight. Uh, remember, we do have some upcoming lectures. Uh, please, please refer to our website. Be careful out there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chris.